And I was John Heaton, and today I'm gonna I'm gonna compare the three McCartney albums, McCartney, McCartney Two, and McCartney Three. Not so much musically, because I've done separate videos on each album, but really compare the background to each, and the promotion techniques used to launch them, how they received that kind of thing, and it's quite an interesting contrast these three moments in Paul's career because they're all very different moments for various reasons and um, before I get into the comparisons I just want to say that promoting an album extravagantly is nothing new from Paul and it's actually nothing new from some of the other ex-Beatles as well this All Things Must Pass is possibly the most lavishly packaged now overpriced Beatles solo album of all. Um, so Paul is not alone here and he's been using various techniques throughout the years to promote his albums such as TV interviews, radio interviews, written newspaper interviews, standard advertising, marketing including recently releasing multiple formats of the same album. Um, in the olden days he would release a press pack, he would release promotional postcards for London Town, he would promote, pr uh, release promotional cigarette cards for Back to the Egg. Um, quite a few of his albums came with posters, Band on the Run, Venus and Mars came with two posters and a sticker, two stickers, three stickers I think. London Town came with a poster, Wings Greatest came with a poster. As I say, he wasn't alone. John Lennon's Imagine included the lyric sheet, a poster and a postcard. Um, so go back to the time of McCartney, the first solo album. This was April 1970 and um, the Beatles were just about to split up and Paul was basically later accused of using the Beatles split to promote his album but I think it happened more or less by accident. It was pretty bad timing because he wanted to release this album, the Beatles wanted to release Let It Be, Ringo was sent round to Paul's house to negotiate Paul's album being delayed, Paul lost his temper, threw Ringo out of the house, um, Ringo, Ringo said Paul should get his own way, so he did, so the album was scheduled for release on April the 17th, and um, a week before, Paul... Uh, phoned John and said, I'm, I'm leaving the, the group too, because John had already left. And he released a, a press interview, which it's a little bit difficult to establish the facts here, because Paul says that the, the questions were written by the Apple staff, and he just answered them. And Derek Taylor says that Paul was only supposed to talk about how the album was made, track by track. All, most of the questions were made up by Paul. Either way... It doesn't come across as a very nice interview. This is lit. You can tell he's tense. You can tell he's hurting. The Beatles are splitting up after all. And some of the questions are a little uh, unfortunate, such as, do you miss the other Beatles and George Martin? Was there a moment, e.g., when you thought, wish Ringo here, was here for this break? Answer, no. Assuming this is a very big, ha big hit album, will you do another? Even if it isn't, I will continue to do what I want, when I want. Are you planning a new album or single with the Beatles? No. Is this album a rest away from the Beatles or the start of a solo career? Time will tell. Being a solo being, being a solo means it's the start of a solo career and not being done with the Beatles means it's a rest, so it's both. Uh, is your break with the Beatles temporary or permanent due to personal differences or musical ones? Personal differences, musical differences, business differences, but most of all because I have a better time with my family. Temporary or permanent, I don't know. He's not actually saying the Beatles are split. He's saying they're temporarily split. But the press jumped on this. Headlines all over the world. Paul is quitting the Beatles. John got jealous that he hadn't done it himself to promote an album. Uh, he called Paul the best PR person in the world as if he'd done it deliberately. As I say, it probably helped sell the album to, in, to some extent, but it also backfired on Paul because a lot of the public and the critics immediately blame Paul for the split when actually he was uh, not the first to leave. John had left the group the previous September and was asked to keep it quiet. So for the next three years or so the critics had it in for him and you could argue for most of the 70s 
he was an easy target and uh, they tended to slag off his albums. Um, the other Beatles fell out with him over this and over him taking them to court. So if it was meant as a PR technique to sell the McCartney album, it backfired um, pretty badly. Um, anyway, to the album. The album itself is, you know, light and loose as he wanted it to be and the, the music is charming. It's just that it went with this slightly uh, um, unfortunate interview which had a bit of a sour taste to it and was a little bit bitter and, you know, he was hurting. So it's not a surprise. It's just that all these family pictures of uh, Paul being a contented family man slightly went against the, uh, the angst from that interview and uh, the arguments he was having behind the scenes with the other Beatles or not turning up to the office because Klein was there. Uh, there was no single to promote this McCartney album. It sold based on the fact he was a Beatle. A lot of people were expecting Abbey Road Mark II, didn't get it, tended to get slagged off at the time. As Carr and Tyler said, hindsight displays its charms. So these days it's seen as a bit of a lo-fi classic, um, despite the fact at the time George was lukewarm about it, as was Ringo, and Lennon was openly dismissive of it. So it's interesting that it came out in such a turbulent period, and uh, Paul was clashing with the other Beatles, and uh, that might have coloured their judgement of his album. And he says also in the interview, I play all the instruments on the album, and the, the, then the question is, why? And he says, because I think I'm pretty good. So it was a bit, a bit full of himself as well there. So we come on to McCartney too, and this was not overly promoted in terms of... Um, there was a, an advanced single, which was not the case for McCartney or McCartney 3, um, which was coming up, which um, came out about a month before... Uh, and I do remember it zooming into the top 40 in the UK and it's a new entry at number seven and then rose to number two the following week. Um, so that got everyone aware that Paul was making a record. I think the previous December's Christmas time, when it, Paul had seen how it had effortlessly made number six in the charts and thought, well, maybe I should go solo. But uh, at the time, he'd, he had just recorded a whole album's worth of material and just thought he'd put it out for fun. Um, in, the, in the interviews he gives at the time of McCartney 2, he's not saying wings are finished. Um, he's saying this is just, a, I wanted to do something different. Um, he's interviewed on the radio, Andy Peebles does a very, very um, lengthy retrospective on Paul's solo career, plus talking about the new album, the same format that he would use with John Lennon in the December of that year, which is interesting that they, John and Paul, Paul both were interviewed by the same DJ in the same year. Uh, it was particularly ironic in one of the interviews in 1980, and they're very good interviews, by the way. The, the Peebles one is good, the Tim Rice one on TV, the Paul Gambaccini one in Club Sandwich, which Andrew Brooks kindly sent to me, and there's an interview on Countdown. They're all good interviews. And, but in one interview, he's asked, uh, one, one fan wants to know if, if the other Beatles are still alive. Um, this was May 1980, and Paul said, yep, they're all alive and kicking. And of course, December of that year, we, we would lose John. So in terms of reviews, so not overly promoted, well, good good amount of TV and radio interviews, but um, no coloured vinyls or anything like that. Uh, but the, the reviews were very mixed. I mean, this is Danny Baker, the famous, he wrote for AM Enemy and then became a famous DJ. Um, this is a low, low trip. You'd think Paul McCartney has far more enough, more than enough money to, than to resort to cheap cons like this. McCartney too is Paul's homebrew bitter kit that he literally knocked together at home with the minimum technology and thought. It sounds like the most desperate of artists' memorial rip-offs, one of, one of those that a company slings out after all the compilations, but just before the dialogue album. <laughs> Um, then he concludes McCartney 2 isn't worth the plastic it's printed on neither is Paul but he's, he'll go on doodling and fooling his public because they're too frightened to ditch him and his past and he's too rich to be stopped so that just gives you an indication of some of the negative reviews he was receiving at the time not only for McCartney 2 but for London Town and Back to the Egg I seem to remember mostly negative um, 
probably, if I, I don't remember, but probably go back, Speed of Sound and Venus and Mars, some of the reviews there were, were negative. I just think critics tended to have it in for Paul and Wings and thought them a bit soft. I don't agree with that, but that's the way it was. But Carr and Tyler, in this wonderful book, which I've showed you many times, uh, they're quite happy with McCartney too, because they, they'd been saying he should have gone solo for the last couple of years. And um, they're saying they, they, they are quite positive about this album. Uh, it all went rather well, relaxed him, you know, so he extended the rental and kept on setting up synthesizer envelopes, fitting bass patterns and guitar chords in underneath, working vocals in on top. It got even better, so a further extension of high was fixed and the process continued. And being the rather inspired doodler and patient craftsman that he is, in another few days or so, Macca realised that he had what he was the carcass of his new album. And rather pretty, nay, even interesting it is too. No less than three hitches singles, blah, blah. So, and then he says, uh, they say at the end, um, it offered positive indication that record buyers do indeed want McCartney without the excess baggage. Now they're talking about the excess baggage as wings. Which I think is a bit unfortunate because, okay, Paul, it was interesting to hear Paul on his own for McCartney too. It was wonderful to hear him do a polished solo album with Tug of War. But after that, one kind of, I wish that he was back with, with Wings really because it all went a bit downhill for a few years with unfortunate collaborations with, with a lot of fa other famous artists and uh, a dip in quality. And uh, they were complaining that no one tells him when a song is bad within the Wings years, well, even less so during the solo years. Didn't even have Denny Lane to to um, to talk to about the songs. So, it, I don't know. Anyway, I'm, I'm not, not everyone agrees with me on this, but uh, I think it's interesting that uh, Carr and Tyler are against Wings and celebrating McCartney going solo, but that's not, not necessarily a good thing in the longer run. Um, the Japan pop bust inadvertently helped sell this album. It certainly helped raise Paul's profile. But I think that's, that can't be described as uh, deliberate. It was just he benefited from that period. But uh, the song Frozen Jap on McCartney 2, uh, I can't really believe that that was already titled before the, the pop bust. I think that's a bit of a dig, but I might be wrong. Uh, the, the song was changed to Frozen Japanese for the Japanese edition, by the way. Um, the picture on the cover, I think, is is excellent. And I think the, the gatefold is beautiful. I think that's really nice. Uh, obviously, the back cover of McCartney is superb. And the front cover is just a some bowl of cherries being spilt in Antigua, and Linda took the photo. But I've always thought that was metaphorical, meaning Life is just a bowl of cherries, as, as the song Bad Boy goes. Um, and the cherries, the, the bowl has been spilt and all the cherries have fallen out, meaning the Beatles have split and I'm on my own. I've always thought it was metaphorical. I might be completely wrong, probably am, but uh, one can read all kinds of things into this. Uh, so as I say, some good interviews came with McCartney too. There's a good uh, one here called the McCartney Interview with... A guy, a guy from musician, player and listener, Vic Garbarini, and he asked decent questions. That's a really good interview. I just think he's on really good form in 1980. He's relaxed. He knows that he's achieved a lot with Wings. Uh, he's doing well in the charts. Paul John is still alive. I, I just think it's, it's a glorious time for him. He's taken some time off touring. He's bringing up his kids. And he seems very content, um, not that he doesn't in other periods of his career, but particularly content in 1980. Uh, we have the Waterfall single, um, which, okay, the fans bought it, but at least it had a B-side which wasn't on the album. The same goes for coming up. And Temporary Secretary, the 12-inch single of that, that had Secret Friend on the B-side. So the, the fans got value for money, whereas, um, you know, these days, as I'll come to with McCartney 3, one has to fork out a lot more money to, 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 the, to buy all the tracks available. Um, so I think that was all I had to say about McCartney 2, was it? Um, yeah, I'll go on to the McCartney 3, I think. Um, yeah, so again, decent cover. 
I, I don't much like the back cover, him sitting on a horse actually with his head stuck slightly in the air. Um, don't much like that picture, but I, I like the artwork, the Gatefold member of King McCartney one. Um, but one has to say that it's a pr it was a very over the top marketing campaign for McCartney three and uh, James Griffiths, my mate on YouTube, said in these COVID times it seemed particularly uh, distasteful. Uh, Dave Costello said, said the gimmicks um, on this album uh, reached an all-time low. Uh, they reached an all-time high in terms of numbers. I mean, if you really want to, to get all the versions available of McCartney 3, you would be forking out a hell of a lot of money because it was available on many, many different colours, vinyl-wise. The four bonus tracks, one had to buy four CDs to get individual bonus tracks. Uh, they are available in different colours. They come with hats, they come with dice, they come with face masks, COVID face masks, you name it. If you really are a collector and you want to get, and I've seen a few collectors on the internet showing off their, their collection. I'm just content to have the CD at the moment. I haven't even got the vinyl, it hasn't come to Hungary, although my son managed to pick up a copy. So in our household, we just have one vinyl and one CD, and I think that's sufficient. I'll pick up the vinyl at some stage, but I'm in no hurry. And I hear he even released eight track versions of this album and a cassette version. Even a rumor of a 78 RPM version to reflect the fact, the fact that Paul's 78, even though no one has a 78 record player. But frank, frankly, people are not buying these things to play. They're buying them as collector's items. And uh, I just think it's all a bit cynical. I know Adrian Allen, you have strong views about this. I agree with you. I think there's nothing wrong with promoting an album. I think the case of McCartney 2 was a good example of how to promote, promote an album. You put out a single with a unique B-side. You do a few radio interviews, you do a couple of TV interviews, you do a follow-up single, and that's about it. Uh, and here, with McCartney 3, even though it did achieve what he wanted, it got him to number one, or it helped, should we say, get him to number one. And it's not a bad album musically. I do think it's inferior to McCartney 2, which is inferior in turn to McCartney. That, that would be my ranking if you had to push me on it. But I'm not really talking about the music in this review. I'm talking about the promotional, the rather excessive and cynical, because um, they, they know certain fans will lap up different versions, however many they put out. Uh, and they've just milked it, like uh, they've milked a cow or something. And uh, presumably MPL's uh, counting all the, all the pennies of how much money they've made on this album. And, you know, good luck to them, but I think I think I'm in, I'm left with a slightly sour taste in my mouth. I mean, obviously there were a lot of TV interviews as well, the standard ones with and the radio ones with uh, Howard Stern, TV with Idris Elba, Idris Elba. Um, I'm not against that, and a lot of video singles and stuff. Not against that particularly, but I just think that the overall tone of the marketing campaign was uh, over the top, and uh, I don't mean mean to offend. Paul McCartney's music, when I say that, it's got nothing to do with his music. Uh, I still bought the album, and you know, his defenders say, well, it's a free world, you can buy one version, or you can buy 16. And yeah, that's true. But I, I just thought it was a bit distasteful. That's my view. And uh, it, interesting to contrast 1970 to 1980 to 2020, but two very, three very different periods in his career and uh, one just, I really enjoyed going back to 1980 and see the, seeing those interviews, not only because he looked younger, just because he seemed to be more in the prime of his, uh, of his career and with good stuff still to come as we know. I mean, he still may produce stuff now after this, but uh, I think we probably had the best of him now, if we're honest. Um, whereas in 1980, that wasn't necessarily the case. He still we're pretty hopeful that he had a, a few gold nuggets in him, and he, and he indeed did. So that was my views. Hope it wasn't too rambling. Thank you for watching. See you next time.